Great Lives is a download from Radio 4. We hope you enjoy what you're about to hear. L'Italia ha finalmente il suo impero. The voice of Benito Mussolini. Not this week's great life, good heavens no, but a force that very largely shaped and finally ended the life we're going to discuss. It's the life of someone who struggled against the rise of fascism in Italy and was a result imprisoned for a long time, separated from his family, but remained true to his beliefs and practised them behind bars. This could, our guest suggests, be the story of Nelson Mandela, but while Mandela's struggle had a happy ending, that of Antonio Gramsci ended in tragedy. Our guest today is Dr Tom Shakespeare, senior lecturer at the medical school in the University of East Anglia and a leading campaigner for the rights of disabled people. He has a background in sociology and ethics, is the author of books on the politics of disability. And Tom, are you serious about the Mandela parallel? I'd never heard of Antonio Gramsci before we started on this programme. Why should I have? Should our listeners? Why? I think they should have done. I know they won't have done. Like Mandela, Gramsci was a communist. That's not very fashionable anymore. Like Mandela, he was not defeated, not bowed. He uh, ran classes while he was in prison. That man he started the programme with, Benito Mussolini, he said before the trial, we must stop this brain from working for 20 years. So Mussolini was frightened of Gramsci. Gramsci was a a, a cripple. He was a hunchbacked. He had Pott's disease, a sort of tuberculosis. And yet, and you could barely hear him speak. He made one speech in the Italian parliament. Mussolini strained to hear what he was saying. He was being denounced by this little man with a great spirit who went on to write essays and, and, and thoughts and notebooks that live today is about the only sort of Marxist text that most people would really need to read. They're very interesting, very relevant even now. How did you first encounter him? I did social and political science at Cambridge and I had an inspiring uh, lecturer called Paul Ginsborg and he told me about Gramsci. And literally, I just thought, oh my goodness, a democratic socialist and, and a disabled d- democratic socialist. <laughs> what more? I'm going to put his picture on my wall. I think I, I did identify with him. That sounds very arrogant and presumptuous. But there are not so many disabled radicals that come through history. Disabled people are pretty invisible. So when you come across across a guy like Gramsci, who really was respected by all. If you go to Italy today, you know, in loads of cities and towns and villages in Italy, you have Piazza Antonio Gramsci, Via Antonio Gramsci. He's still remembered. Now, what, what I want to explore during this, this programme is, is why a man who died in prison, uh, who, who wrote a bit, but none of whose ideas ever came to pass in, in Italy, who, whose career could be seen as a failure, why... Why the fame? Let's start at the beginning and ask a little bit about his life. What was his background? He was born in Sardinia, which was very, very poor at the time. His father had come over to Sardinia from the mainland and was a sort of low-level bureaucrat, a sort of civil servant. Uh, His mother was from sort of Sardinian peasant stock. Uh, You know, really pretty poor background, made poorer because his father was imprisoned, uh, probably on trumped-up charges of corruption, leaving this this, uh, mum with six kids, I think it was six kids, a very, very poor, desperately poor upbringing, and Gramsci was crippled. He was a hunchback. They tried to straighten him out. There's this story of him being suspended from the barn in this sort of harness to make him make him sort of stronger and bigger. To straighten his spine. Exactly. He didn't get much education. The village school wasn't very good, but he was brilliant. And eventually he got to Turin on a scholarship because there's no way his family could have afforded it where he attended the university. But how could this little boy, family with no money, in a nowhere place upon whose head fate had landed a sledgehammer blow. Where did he find the spirit to become what he did? And is there any early indication of the the little boy's determination? To be honest, I don't know. I know that he was he was writing articles for the local newspaper before he left Sardinia. You know, as a teenager, he was writing articles. Uh, you know, he was very interested in politics. He was very interested in Sardinian folklore. I think his mother was a formidable character. She was a, a very loving mother to the end of his days. You know, he was writing to her. She was not 
educated, but she was interested and knowledgeable. And I think, yeah, his interest in folklore and the stories. Later, he would write to his wife, uh, telling her Sardinian folk tales, which I believe he'd probably got from his mum, and, and saying, please, tell my kids these folk tales that I learned because they have a moral. He's a, obviously a political figure. He's also a very moral figure. He has a, a real clear idea of what people should be and how they should struggle against the, the, the difficulties they face, whether those are physical or whether those are, are social you, and political. You've got a photograph I can see of him. Yeah. Can, can I have a look at it? Yes. Yes. So he, here he is. He's a little guy. I would like to think you could see some burning determination in his eyes. Oh, there's this kind of early example of the messed up hair look and with the round spectacles. It is actually quite an imposing, quite a striking face. I think people loved him. Um, yeah, he was he was happy to call a spade a spade and to, to attack people. But I think he also inspired loyalty and love uh, from other people. I want to talk now about the thoughts, the the ideas and helping us to find out more on that. We're lucky to have Professor Anne Sassoon, who's written extensively about it. And what is it about his work that you find particularly engaging, appealing? I'm so impressed with his creativity, with his ability to look at small bits of information, to think about it, to get started in, in new directions. Today we'd say uh, thinking outside the box And I think for me, going back to when I was first interested in him, he's very different from a kind of closed-minded old left, if you like. Give me an example. Well, particularly when he was in prison, he actually had books available. He had journals available. And he would take a, a review of a play or of a book and start thinking, how does that say something about the culture of this period? Or how does this say something? Can I take some bit of information, even from people he didn't disagree with, to think, what is the nature of this society I'm living in? What is the kind of culture that we're living in? He believed in education in the sense that he thought everyone had potential to develop themselves. So that, that's the kind of thing that really inspired me. Anne mentioned his sort of cultural interest. Yeah, he was interested in Pirandello, okay. the dramatist. All this. But I was very touched to find he loved G.K. Chesterton, but particularly he loved Rudyard Kipling. Now, that's surprising, <laughs> Rudyard Kipling being an imperialist. But when the fascists came about uh, 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 during his career in Italy, he compared these petty bourgeois fascists to the bandalogues. And I don't know if you remember in the Jungle Book, that's one of his favourite books, the Bandalog are the monkeys, destructive, naughty, evil monkeys that, uh, not in the Disney version, but in the original version, uh, they fight amongst themselves. They're a very, very uh, negative force. And so there you are, you know, how many thinkers in the throes of fascist Italy would have started comparing the uh, the fascist demagogues to characters from the Jungle Book? I like that. That's that's an originality and a, and and a wit. In, it, it, I was fascinated with this interest in Chesterton. And I went back to read the Father Brown stories. Mm. And what Father Brown does, this Catholic priest, he goes to Spain in the 1920s. This is the fictionalized character. And what he does is try to put his himself in the shoes of the thief or the criminal and try to th- extrapolate from that why that person might have done it, but how to find, to discover who it was and so on. And I found this kind of parallel with Gramsci because he's actually very interested. Why did parts of the Italian population and part of the poor population actually support fascism? He was against fascism, but unless you could understand that, you couldn't actually uh, begin to oppose it effectively. Tell me a bit more about the development of his political thinking. Did this begin young? His older brother was an Italian socialist and he went to Turin before Gramsci did. Sardinia is so poor, is so in other terms underdeveloped. He was very agricultural, very poor. And Turin was this advanced industrial city. It was the home of uh, Fiat, of the automobile industry and so on. So he was influenced by that. Even earlier, there was a, there was a Sardinian nationalist movement that was against the dominance of the, of the mainland and so on. But I think that probably the period when Gramsci wins his scholarship and he goes to the University of Turin is really the beginning of his own political activity. So I would really trace it to when he's at university. Though, Tom, he, he actually, I don't know if you'd say he flunked out of university, but he didn't finish. No, he didn't finish because he felt the role of the intellectual was in the struggle. He uh, uh, hated sort of wishy-washy, sit-on-a-fence in- in- intellectuals. He talked about Ponzio Pilatismo. 
Ponzio Pilatismo is like being like Pontius Pilate, washing your hands of everyday life. What he wanted was these sort of engaged intellectuals who would actually get out there and struggle, whatever it was for. And I think that's one of the things that inspires me, that you, can't, you shouldn't be in your ivory tower. You actually should be uh, making a difference. So it doesn't surprise me. You know, he was busy writing a, a, a newspaper, which started being weekly and then became daily. He was involved in the factory councils movement. There's these wonderful, uh, for the left, years that called the Biennio Rosso, the, the red years after the First World War, when it really looked as if not just Russia, but Germany and Italy might have a, 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 a communist revolution. He was right in the thick of it in Italy. And of course, that failed. But even right up to the time that he was imprisoned, he thought it might go my way. I'm going to hang on in here. You know, fascism, it can't last. You know, it's going to fall apart and we're going to be there. His motto was pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. Now, you know, whatever you are, whatever your political yeah, persuasion, it's great... pessimism of the intellect, <laughs> optimism of the will. He didn't invent it, but that's what his uh, guiding star was. Uh, he left university. He didn't finish yeah. his, his, his degree. Uh, what happened to him then? Once Mussolini comes to power in 1922, he's a journalist. He was active in the Italian Socialist Party, but yeah. I think he was also engaged with what he saw as developing in the Soviet Union. He writes very, very early on that if you're going to be successful in changing society, you have to establish broad basis of consent. He then goes abroad. He goes to Moscow. He's briefly also in Vienna, um, working for the Communist International. And then eventually he is elected to the Italian parliament. This is a period that's very violent in in Italian society. It's like a civil war from... 1920 onwards, Hmm. Mussolini comes to power in 1922. There's a crackdown on Catholic anti-fascists and, of course, on the left. But what I want to add is that he went to, to Moscow as a, to, to, to take part in the Communist International and he had a, he had a nervous breakdown. I mean, his health is very bad throughout this period, depression and physical ailments. And in the sanatorium to which he was sent, he met Julia and Julia became his, his wife and, you know, the love of his life, I think. And they had sons. They first had Delio and then later when she came to stay with him in, in Italy, they, she conceived Giuliano, who he never met because... Julia went back to uh, Moscow. Later, his letters to his children are, are lovely documents, and his children uh, you know, continue to live in Moscow, certainly until recently. But Tom, Anne said that uh, he developed early on a wariness about the way things might, communism might develop. But from what you say, it, it appears that he, he made the Soviet Union his spiritual home, certainly his family's home. Do we have any sense of how he responded to the way communism was in fact developing. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. He was more of a democratic socialist, certainly, than any of the others of that era, in the sense that he did feel that it was about legitimacy. It's about winning the hearts and minds of the people. And he wrote to the Communist International, for example, at the time after Lenin's death, the rise of Stalin, he wrote, say, this is terrible. This is going the wrong way. And it was his comrade, Toliatti, who was in Moscow, who suppressed the letter. Because he knew that if uh, Gramsci's complaints about Stalin became publicly known, that was the end of Gramsci. And in fact, the English historian, Eric Hobsbawm, who died a few years ago, uh, said that, ironically, it was probably Mussolini putting Gramsci in prison that saved him from Stalin. Because if he had been in Moscow with the rest of the communist leaders, complaining, writing, protesting, we know what would have happened to him. If he really disagreed with the way communism was evolving and developing, wouldn't it sing out loud and clear from his writing? I Mm. think him being in Moscow in those years, in the 1920s, I think he could see what some of the difficulties were. But he was very concerned that the regime was not establishing consent amongst wide groupings in the population. Now, once he's in prison, he can't be very explicit And I'm not just reading into it. He wanted to understand what the nature of political power was in a whole range of regimes, from Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal to fascist Italy to the Soviet Union. But a lot of it was in code. So my main argument was that he was critical and 
that we could see in the notebooks the kind of criticisms that he made. I think, like a lot of communists, he thought that, you know, it was great the revolution had happened in Russia, but really Russia wasn't ready for it. And therefore they ended up with this uh, uh, totalitarian uh, process. I think he thought that actually somewhere like Italy might be a lot more appropriate. Uh, and he couldn't understand, well, he probably could understand, but he was trying to work out why it hadn't happened. Why well, Nobody predicted fascism. You're listening to Great Lives, and today our subject is the Italian revolutionary thinker Antonio Gramsci, proposed by Dr Tom Shakespeare, with expert witness Professor Anne Sassoon. We've established the picture of a a small, desperately disabled man whose writing and thinking is becoming more and more widely known He became the part founder of L'Ordine Nuovo, a weekly review of socialist culture. But what was he writing? What was he thinking? Uh, You still haven't really given me, either of you, any impression of the new ideas or new arguments coming from this man. He's writing culture, he's writing history, he's trying to reinterpret Machiavelli for the modern age, he's writing about uh, plays and he's writing about American factory systems, he's writing about everything really. But the ideas that come through is this notion of hegemony. Because what he's saying is that the way that uh, the ruling class rule is not just by coercion, it's not just by having police force and and military, it's by consent. And he says, look, we've got to understand that we have to win people's hearts and minds and therefore we have to really work with the people in all sorts of different ways. And so he sort of foreshadows a lot of ideas about politics which actually on left and right in the post-war period became very, very important. Forgive me. Striking a a slightly sceptical note here, your thought that he wanted to know why people were responding as they they did, it's the the disappointment that is always felt on the left when people don't actually seem to respond very well to what they hoped was going to be a a, a mass movement. I think it's actually quite different from that, uh, Matthew, if I could say, because Mm. I think what if people don't respond, the question he would ask is why? He wanted to understand where people were in their own daily lives. It wasn't to romanticize it, but unless you could really understand that, you could not have be in some kind of contact with people. So he wanted to know why. What was his conclusion? Well, his conclusion was that very often, lacking education, lacking the ability to analyse more broadly, very often people were trapped in a very narrow frame. Yeah. We would put different types of language on this in terms of... But this, um, is, this is the old socialist doctrine, isn't it? Unfortunately, the people don't understand. Well, no, I, I, I profoundly disagree. And I think, let me just give you an example. At a certain point, he, he engages with the idea that people, let's say, in the Italian side were very small C conservative. And he says, well, there's something very common sensical about that because today there are these intellectuals or these politicians or people that have a very articulate view and they come and try to convince us of something and tomorrow there'll be something else somebody else with equally articulate ideas and we can't argue against it so people are small c conservative and hold on to what they feel they really know now if you don't understand that you can't make contact with people so you have to engage with that I don't think that he sort of blames the people, but what he is frustrated about is apathy. He's really frustrated with that because he lives and breathes politics and he can't believe it that people are sitting by. There's a quotation here. What comes to pass does so not so much because a few people want it to happen as because the mass of citizens abdicate their responsibility and let things be. So he's very frustrated uh, when people just sort of sit by and and these thugs, these appalling thugs are marching into power and nobody's doing anything about it. But but isn't isn't this a common response right across the left all through the last hundred years or so, a a disappointment in human beings, that they don't appear to be rising up, that they don't appear to show the necessary altruism. Yes, to a certain extent. But if you were living and watching the fascists taking over your country Mm. and that most people were doing very little, wouldn't you feel frustrated. I mean, it, it's not about left or right. It's about opposition to tyranny. He's not top down. He's gra- he wants to come from the bottom up where people yeah. are at. And that's what he's saying to his comrades. He's yeah. saying, you can't force people to this. You have to be with them and work with them and hope that they come to your point of view. And that's a profoundly democratic sentiment. 
he was very different from those on the left who kind of blamed the people for fascism. It was the apathy. But he also said, if people are are lending their support to fascism, what are they getting out of it? The fascists expanded the state machinery and they gave people jobs. They built modernist cities. They had um, huge uh, sort of development projects. And made the railways right on time. They made the railways right on time. They drained the Prontine marshes. They did a range of things like that. They gave people that came from very impoverished backgrounds some kind of stake in the future of the society. Now, the lesson there was that if you were on the left, you had to think how could people feel they had a stake in the change in the society? He did get himself elected to Parliament. He was elected to Parliament. What happened? Tell me about that. Well, he had this brief period in Parliament. There was a period when the Italian fascists allowed the Parliament to continue, but then they had a clamp down. And from then on, he was in prison. I'm just astounded by his courage because a lot of the other Italian communist leaders left. They went to Moscow. They went to Paris. They went somewhere else. And why wouldn't you? You could see the writing on the wall. But he came back. And remember, yeah, this is a, a, a crippled, ill, sick man who has a wife and children back home and he could nobody would blame him if he left, but he hung on. There were chances for him to get out if he, you know, uh, signed and, and said, confessed to... Were there? Yes, mm. version. The, 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 but he absolutely refused to. Yeah, it's like Mandela. You know, time and time again in prison, the apartheid regime said, look, if you just sort of say we're OK, you know, you can get out. Or if you just sort of compromise a bit, we can let you out. But he never did. I'd like to hear a bit more about his time... In prison. How long was he in for, roughly? He was in for about 10 years. At a certain yeah. point, he's transferred to a clinic and he's still under um, sort of semi prison conditions. But it must be but, awful for someone with his disabilities in a, in absolutely, a common prison. Absolutely, absolutely. And for a while, he was in this <laughs> island off the, the coast of Sicily when he was tried, and he was in a, a couple of different prisons. But nonetheless, and something I admire about him, he wrote these notebooks. Very creative and they're very inspiring for those of us who read them later on. These notebooks, Tom, really form the centre of what we would now call his work, don't they? That's right. There were 33 notebooks, 2,350 printed pages. They're loads of stuff. He, He said he wanted to write something forever. He wanted to leave a legacy. And after he died, they were smuggled out of his cell. You know, this was a precious resource for the Western, you know, left. He was absolutely determined to write. He, d- he ran classes, I think. He was educating his cellmates and all the rest of it. All this time he had insomnia, he had kidney disease, he had la- heart problems, yeah. all sorts of problems. And then his, his disabilities took another turn, and at the end of which he couldn't even walk, apparently. Yeah. yeah, absolutely crippled and separated from his wife and his children. To whom he wrote... Was and it he wrote every these, day or every week? He wrote week? these wonderful, yeah. wonderful letters. Yeah, it took weeks to get a reply. He didn't even know if they'd arrived. His connections to his mother, to his wife, to his children were very, very attenuated. He was very lonely and, and, and struggling. Why was Mussolini so scared of him? He doesn't sound to me like a huge threat. He was the leader of the Italian Communist Party and the Communist Party was very strong. I mean, From prison? Yeah, uh, like, well, like, he had been. He yeah. had been. Mm. I mean, the, the, the leadership was then in Moscow. But after the war, the Italian Communist Party was the biggest communist party in Western Europe. It was mm. huge. It was the opposition in Italy. The CIA were very worried about it. Remember, yeah, in the war, the partisans, the communist partisans, were the ones who, you know, were the backbone of the resistance yes. to first remember, fascism I, and then I, Germany. I was in the Foreign Office in the 1970s and um, Western foreign ministries mm. were obsessed by and, and terrified by the... Italian Communist Party, we would have endless dispatches from our ambassador as to what the chance of the PCI or the PSI or some combination of the two succeeding. Absolutely. It's, it's easy to forget that. And that's a lot to do with Gramsci because he saved communism from Stalin, I would say. I was a student in the 80s at Cambridge and, you know, this is where I bought this copy of this biography and I've got my notebook from those days. I was inspired. I wouldn't have been inspired by Stalin. I mean, believe me, I was, I was a Democrat. But Euro-communism, this idea of the cultural struggle and all the rest of it, I could buy into that. You know, it's, it's not my position anymore. And, and that's why Gramsci was important, because he found a way that you could be on the left in a communist sense, without being a Stalinist. I'm nodding here as Tom describes them. The ideas felt fresh. He was an environmentalist. He's writing about deforestation and how awful it is to to destroy the land in pursuit of short-term profit. So there's plenty you can read that really speak to us today. 
And that sense of needing to be engaged, what's the point of ideas unless we do something about them? And whether you're of the right or the left or the centre or the environment or the feminist or whatever... That surely speaks to us. Now, I'm disabled. I'm part of the disability movement. And the disability movement started with organic intellectuals. It was disabled people in care homes and institutions who started getting together in the 70s, going, hang on a minute, this isn't right. We should be included. Why are we segregated? I have a nice um, short quote that has Mm. to do with the intellectuals. He writes, the intellectual's error consists in believing that one can know without understanding and even more, without feeling and being impassioned. So you can't even know about society unless you try to deeply, to understand deeply about it and to feel and be impassioned by the society that you live in. Did he die in prison, Tom? No, he he was in a in a, a clinic in Rome. He died literally, I think, days after the expiry of his sentence. He was buried in Rome. Only two people attended his funeral, except for the secret policeman following behind. His life is tragic, but also heroic. Those notebooks smuggled out, those letters published and inspiring people, inspired me. So his legacy, I think, does live on. He was rediscovered from the late 60s onwards, was a huge interest all over the world. There are people in Latin America, he's very interested in him. There are people in Japan, really throughout the world. You've persuaded me, and Tom has persuaded me, that he has inspired a lot of people and that a lot of people were and are very interested in him. I didn't need any persuading that he was a a great human being in terms of his struggle against adversity and also the way he conducted himself all through his life. But if Gramsci is not a set of coherent ideas, then what is he? And if he is a set of coherent ideas, then they are the ideas of the left. And the left has failed. The central theory of human society, which must have lain at the centre of what he believed, is completely out of fashion. So why was it a great life? I think that he offers us concepts for understanding. And with respect, Matthew, you were part of a Thatcher uh, Mm. government. And what did they try to do? They tried to win the battle of ideas. Mm. They tried to replace the social democratic hegemony with their own hegemony and yeah. did pretty damn well. Yeah. You know, in the 80s, you know, we're all Thatcher's children. We thought differently thanks to your people. There was a coercion, but there was actually consent there as well. Thatcher won because she won over working class people because she offered them ideas. She, I'm sure, never thought of Gramsci one day in her life. But what she was doing and what people in the post-war period were doing were this consciousness raising, this struggle on the basis of ideas, which I think Gramsci was the one of the earliest people to talk about. We might not have won. I'm not a communist anymore, but I do struggle for a better world, and the struggle continues. My thanks to Dr Tom Shakespeare for championing the great life of Gramsci and to our expert witness, Professor Anne Sassoon. Goodbye. Thank you for downloading this programme from Radio 4. There are some 250 other editions of Great Lives available on the Radio 4 website.